Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk number 76. Yeah. 76. You know, the first time we did this, it's like, oh, okay, we'll try it this way. Well, 76 episodes later, here we are still doing it and answering your questions and uh, talking about uh, voiceover studio tech, which is really what people want to hear you and I talk about, because when we talk, people just seem to listen, whether we know what we're talking about or not, but it always sounds like we do. <laughs> uh. Anyway, we've got some great stuff tonight. Uh, in your tech update, you've got all sorts of cool stuff like... Well, Shields Up, it's time to protect yourself from hackers. Now more than ever, I'll, talk, I'll give you a little checklist of things to look out for. Um, ever heard of Deity Microphones? Are they the next Behringer? Mm. I'll tell you why I think I said that. Um, and then uh, a couple other little gadgets, and one, I promise... I. I promise this is my last Personas Revelator IO24 Please. update. <laughs> I swear. Please, I hope it is. But yes, my last update on the Revelator and where I'm at with that. Excellent. And I'm going to talk about something that people don't even know what it is, but they're going to learn at the bottom of the hour. Here. I'm going to learn because I don't know what that means either. The nominal line. The nominal line. What is the nominal line? All I'm right. sure someone will say, no, that's not what it is. I'm excited. Anyway, stay tuned for that. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, welcome. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. <sighs> nice that you have a bathroom close by. I got to go into the house. It's a long way. Apparently it wasn't close <laughs> enough because in the 30 <laughs> seconds I walked out of the room, my webcam <laughs> froze. That was the strangest thing ever. I walked hey. back in and there's not. I'm like, am I a ghost? Okay. It's like, this. it was so weird. Anyway. It's great to well, be here. Yeah, it's, it's great to be anywhere, but it's great to be here you, with all of you uh, voice actors out there learning who want to learn a little bit more about how to record your audio properly because that's what George and I do. There are a lot of people out there that are, you know, they've been voice actors for a while. Yeah. Here's how I record. You need one of these, you need one of those, and you got to have this, that, and the other thing. Buy this $800 overly complicated piece of gear because that's what I use. That's right. Oh, by the way, it took me 20 years to learn how to use it. Uh, yeah, that's a big mistake. A lot of people make, uh, is they, tend to invest in their equipment before they have a chance to understand what equipment they need and even more important, how to use it because having it has nothing to do with how good you sound if you don't know how it works. So if you want to learn properly from the ground up from guys that understand voiceover audio, 
better than anybody, you can contact us because that's what George and I do. We teach this stuff. And if you start there, you put yourself way ahead of everybody else who's using a, a USB mic and, you know, or two tin cans and a string, uh, which I've seen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> if they, you want to work with George, all you have to do is go over to georgev.tech. That's my home on the web. My name is my address. That's the name of the company, and that's how you can find me. And actually, our little team now that we're starting to grow over here at George the Tech. I've added another to the crew named Rich Green, who's the brave one who seems to be more open to taking on Windows audio problems, no. which, is, which is nice. Thanks, He's going to be a busy guy. I told him that. I was like, get ready. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, we, we provide a lot of services anywhere from the good old classic sound check where you send your audio and I give back my notes on your tech, on your sound to uh, designing studios and setting up processing chains and then webinars where we try to teach you how to run all this stuff. So that's what we do over at georgethe.tech. Do we get and team jerseys, by the way? It's, you know, it's about time, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's about darn time. Um, once we get our new colors and our new logo sorted out, maybe I'll be able to do that. Excellent. But Dan does a lot of the same kind of thing in his world, and that's over at homevoiceoverstudio.com yeah head on over there it's just days away from being a new website it's going to be a lot easier mm. to find my specimen collection cup where you can send me your audio and i will analyze your audio talk to anybody that's worked with me on this and you'll know that you'll find out that i'm extremely thorough i'll be very honest with you and after five seconds generally i know exactly what's going on in the room you're in and what corrections you need to make to make it sound seamless. I think that's the thing, George, that people don't understand that when you send out audio, it should be seamless for the person on the other end, meaning they don't have to do much to it unless they are qualified to do something to it. If it's for a commercial, they've got to add the compression to it so it'll float on top of music and all the other things that go on, which you don't have to do as a voice actor. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy teaching is don't be intimidated by all this technology. Yeah, it's a computer. Yeah, it's a microphone. But the best way to look at it, it's a cassette recorder. And it's play, it's record, it's stop. Keep Stop thinking about it as this complex thing with all sorts of scripts running in it and, and, and all the, the drivers and the software. Just hit record and go. And that's what I'll teach you how to do and make it easy for you in the long run. Anyway, it's time for George's tech update because he scours the Internet every Monday at about 3.30 uh, to come up with some stuff to talk about. No, you've been looking at this stuff all week. It's all you do is you're on the Internet finding cool stuff. What do you got for us this week? It's not always cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> tonight this one's it's not uh, cool. yeah. kind of scary stuff. Well, um, one, of my, one of my favorite shows that I listen to for news about tech is called This Week in Tech. And on Sunday, they kind of rang the alarm and said, Shields up! Shields up! It's kind of time if you, uh, if you have a computer and the internet, <laughs> you may want to make sure you've done a few things to be... Uh, Let's see, in the best of health when it comes to preventing infections of the internet kind, uh, because we are, uh, we have not yet quite seen the onslaught of what kind of uh, things we're, we might expect from, uh, well, let's just say Russia, okay? Um, you know, it could be other countries too, and there's a lot of uh, government actors and non just chaotic, uh, you know, uh, anarchists out there looking to make a quick buck on us, but. Here's a few things to kind of just get those shields up, be ready, and have the best things in place to prevent yourself from being an easy target and be exploited and being exploited by hackers. Um, first thing on my little bullet list here is, are you running the latest security update on your computer? Whatever that is, Windows or Mac, make sure you're on the most current security update. On, on a Mac, that means clicking on the Apple the top left and clicking on uh, looking at the word system preferences, or if it's an older OS, it might say updates and clicking on the word words. If it says one update, 
click on the software update icon, and then see what update is waiting for you. Now, there's two main kinds of updates. Some of them are going to be operating system updates, and some of them are going to be security update. And it's important to, to, to differentiate the two. An operating system update may bring along with it a change to your system that you're not expecting. So those you want to be a little more cautious about, be a little bit more prepared to understand that, okay, if I update my operating system, it could cause an issue with a sound driver or a software I'm running. So keep that in mind. But if you see another update that specifically says security update, that's the one you want to check and make sure you do an update on. Also, if there's updates for web browsers, make sure you're updating those as well. So if you use Safari, run the latest Safari because it's going to have the latest security as well as features. So that's important. Make sure you're on the most up-to-date security. Um, here's one that you've probably never thought about because <laughs> when they mentioned it, I realized, well, I hadn't thought about this in a long time. And that is make sure you're on the most up-to-date firmware for your router. Yes, your router. The router is the thing in your, in your home that is the gateway, literally, that's what they call it, the gateway, to the internet. And if your router has old, really outdated firmware, or if worse off, you're using the generic default password for your router, like password, um, that's your password, um, you want to be up to date on, you want to update the password so it's not the defaults, and you want to make sure that if there is a firmware update available for your router, that you install it because that's your first line of defense to being exploited or hacked. Um, so you really want to make sure you're up to date. And that's a reminder for myself because I haven't checked my router's software update in a long time. So um, I'm going to be doing that myself very soon. Um, but that was something they said many people don't check that. And sometimes their router's firmware is years old. And it's an easy place to get hacked. Because think of your router as a server that connects you to the internet. Now, if there's no updates available, at the very least, reboot your router. Um, if there's anything running on that router that shouldn't be there, that you didn't put there, that you don't even know it's there, chances are by just simply rebooting it or unplugging it, turning it off, count to 10, plug it back in, will have wiped that thing out of the memory. So... There's not really storage on most routers. It's all just something that's running in its memory. And when you shut it off and reboot it, whatever that thing is that's running is usually wiped out. So that's another thing to do. Reboot your router or unplug it and plug it back in. Um, another thing, and this is another one, it's a little bit of the more geek side of things. So you, some of you will know what I'm saying and some of you won't. If you know what an IoT device is, then I'm, paying, then I'm talking to you. And if you don't know what an IoT device is, you better learn what this means. An IoT device is an Internet of Things device. And this can be as simple as a power switch that plugs into the wall that talks to an Amazon Echo so that you can say, Amazon, turn on my lights. That's an Internet of Things device. A security camera is an Internet of Things device. A ring doorbell, a smart Wi-Fi controlled light bulb is an Internet of Things device. Make sure that if you're using anything that's questionable, you bought it really discounted online, you're not really sure where its country of origin is or who owns the software you're running, that's something you want to be more aware of and you may want to discontinue using it. So be careful about IoT. Um, also, just make sure, I mentioned earlier Safari updating your browser uh, or up make sure your browser is updated in Safari if you're on Mac. If you're on Windows or Mac and you're running Chrome, your Chrome browser might say update in the upper right-hand corner. If you see that word update, click on it. Now, don't do it right now. <laughs> Wait till you're at the end of your day not watching the show, but update your Chrome browser because Chrome is always updating to patch security issues and et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you're on the most up-to-date Chrome browser. Now, here's something a little scary. So there's a bunch of different uh, security-based tools out there Mainly, we think of them as, you know, antivirus applications. And there's one that's been popular for a very, very long time called Kaspersky. Didn't and he get into all sorts of trouble or something? Wouldn't he go nuts or something? And I don't know about Kaspersky. I do know that um, 
uh, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. There's another another developer of a very famous um, antivirus that somebody is going to know. McAfee. McAfee, yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy did go. That guy did <laughs> uh, do some bad things. Um, but anyway, Kaspersky, it turns out, well, he's Russian. Um, and that's not inherently bad, but there's a lot of people on his team that may be under the influence of the government, whether they want to be or not. And so it's, it's risky enough now that the FCC has officially warned that Kaspersky poses a national security risk. There's a PC Mag article about this. So you can go look it up on PCMag.com, and it talks about the details here. I'm not going to get into it. If you're one of those people, there's, and there's hundreds of millions of installed Kaspersky antivirus apps out there. So one of you guys out there watching the show is using it. Um, you might want to be aware of this and try something different. At the very least, just if you're on Windows, just use the Windows Defender. It's pretty darn good. It's always updated by Microsoft, and you're probably going to be fine with that. If you're on Mac OS and you keep your security updates updated, there's almost nothing to worry about. I have not ever run a uh, antiviral malware application on my Macs. Knock on wood. <laughs> Never been a problem, um, and it's it's been pretty secure. Anyway, yeah. Moving on. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's a company that I got to meet the owner of last week called Deity Microphones. Now, Deity is interesting. You've probably heard of some of their products, maybe if you've been searching around for less expensive alternatives to already inexpensive stuff. Um, that's what Deity tends to do. They tend to look at what's selling from Rode and others and say, maybe I can do that better and maybe even do it for less money. That's what Deity seems to be doing out there. And they have some very interesting products. Like, here's a transmitter that plugs onto a microphone, like right onto the base of the microphone that you might see a reporter use. That's also a recorder. So it's a two for one. You can record and you can be on wireless. Interesting idea. The fact that you're backing up everything you're doing recording. That's not a new idea, but he's doing it with a product that's way less expensive than what's el what else is out there. He also has like a really cool mic. It's called a D4 Duo. It's a video mic that goes on the top of a camera that's a duo mic. So it's picking up, it's more of a shotgun pattern in the front and like a cardioid pattern in the back. So now you're able to record yourself and whoever it is you're interviewing at the same time. So that's a really interesting product. But anyway, Deity is a really interesting company. They're really out there trying to make innovations and make them a lot less expensive. Now I can't vouch for any other products firsthand, but having talked to the fellow that runs the company and seeing how aggressive he is at like getting new things out there that kind of break the price performance, you know, barrier, it's really interesting. Uh, I'd see Ron M in the chat saying, I really like my Deity S mic to shotgun mic. So there you have it. There's a, there's a, someone that's had a good experience. Um, another little thing, my dad at my request took something that already existed, which is a, a mic mute switch. This one's one, this one's made by whirlwind called the mic mute PPD. And he made a little modification. Okay. Not so little, a big modification. <laughs> this big box on the bottom has converted this switch into just being a standard microphone on off mute, which you can see right? Turns my mic on and off into having another interesting feature. And that is a wireless remote power switch transmitter. So think of this as an amalgamation of a mic mute switch box and a transmitter that transmits an on off signal to one of those, just, you know, those Christmas tree light switches, right? That does it all in one thing. And we, and he literally did a mind meld between one of those remotes and this box with some electronics inside this box and makes all this work. So why the heck did we come up? Why did I come up with this idea and why did I make it? Well, wouldn't it be cool if anytime you want to use your mic, a light or several lights somewhere around your house, all wirelessly turn on and turn off whenever you turn on your mic. There's the mic on. That's that lamp back there is hooked to a wireless switch on the wall. 
Well, there could be one down the hall. There could be one in the kids' room. There could be one in the kitchen or the family room. Wherever there's people in your house that makes noise that's interrupting your sessions on a regular basis, this sure beats screaming down the hall, I'm recording! Which uh, now becomes an on-off switch thing. Just a single flick of a switch and all those lights in your house can turn on or off. So this is a very much a prototype. But if it's something of interest to you, let me know. Just email me at george at georgethe.tech about the remote wireless power switch box. And uh, I'll let you know about when we might be uh, actually producing one of these things. It's a very early stages product, proof of, proof, proof of what do you call it? Proof of concept. Yeah, proof of concept. But it works, as you can see, and it's really, really cool. Um, lastly, before I go, a final Personas Revelator IO24 update. I am doing the show with it tonight. As you can hear at the beginning of the show, I was able to play the VOBS jingle of uh, voice from Jeff. All of the sound ins and outs, the mix minuses and all that stuff are totally sorted out. And it's been working great ever since I did the last firmware update. I had to relearn how to use it because they changed internally how the sound drivers work and they made a few pretty fundamental changes to the unit. So I will warn you, if you have a working revelator, it's in your studio and you're using it day to day and you're happy, do not install the firmware update. If you do, chances are it's going to break the unit the way you're used to using it. It's going to change the way it functions. So beware of this. Now that I've gone through it, it's been working fine and I understand it and I know how to make it work. And if somebody else has is in the same boat, let me know. I can get it worked out for you. But um, it is now working fine and it's working the way I think that it should. So that's it for my tech update. I want to learn about the nominal line from yeah, Dan. Yeah, thanks. I mean, people have different words for it. This is what I call it. And it has to do with editing your audio, whether you're using Audacity or Twisted Wave or Adobe Audition. When I'm editing, I want no clicks between my edits. You know, some of you might be using, um, you know, punch and roll or literally roll and punch. Why they call it roll and punch and roll, <laughs> I'll never know. Yeah. But there's a crossover point where the edit takes place automatically, where the, the audio is, is dropped in. And you're going to get a thump. Reasons for that are when you edit, you want to be able to edit from where there's no noise. And I guess the only way to demonstrate this is to show you in Twisted Wave. So I'm going to share my screen here. Now, so, open the so, file. Or, so, or hit record. Yeah, I'll hit record. So here's some audio. Okay, that's all there's, we need. Right there's there. the thin blue line. There's the thin blue line, which was right. a great movie, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so zoom in really tight, like right to the end of the, where the waveform is, like right there and zoom in tighter, zoom in really tight, center that up, zoom in really tight. Now you see where it crosses the line right there. That's right your there. edit point. And you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a crude little thing, but it makes such a huge difference in your ability to edit. Well, here's one more secret. Okay. If you're using Twisted Wave and you have the select mode called Auto Extend to Zero Crossing, zero crossing. it it's does it the zero crossing. for you. So you, when right. you select this range right here, watch what changes. So what it's done is adjust the selection so that when that edit happens, those it's two on. meet at the zero crossing, or as the Dan zero. is calling it, the nominal, the nominal line. line. Same idea. And you're looking at this going, well, wait a minute. I didn't want to make a selection that long. Folks, that selection is five a, a thousandths nanosecond. of a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very, very short period of time. So yeah. you can seamlessly go in there and make edits like that and have them completely disappear. You can remove a mouth noise. You can remove a plosive. You can remove all kinds of stuff this way and have the edit be completely seamless if you use that rule. Right. Absolutely. So it's some call it the, the zero crossover. I, somebody told me it was called the nominal line. They lied to me. I don't know, but it's I that it blue line in the who, middle. It depends who's, who's teaching it, I guess, you know, right. cause it, and every app calls it something different. That's probably part of the problem. So nominal line seems like something you can carry from app to app. Okay. Then I will continue to use that. I will continue anyway, to use it too. 
Well, there you go. Well, see, this is how we compromise. This is how we collaborate. This is how we get your audio perfect. And we want your questions, and we got a ton of them, and we're going to get to them right after these really important messages. So don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> this is Ariana Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. The Harlan Hogan VO1A microphone. Now, perhaps you didn't know this, but almost all of the equipment we use in voiceover was designed for making music. The VO1A is the only microphone specifically designed and tuned for voiceover. And you're hearing me on it right now. Now, obviously, the VO1A is very popular at voiceoveressentials.com, and Harlan has been running low. Until now. Harlan placed an order for a new supply of VO1As from MXL quite a while ago. Now, manufacturing them wasn't an issue, but getting them to the U.S. was, between COVID and shipping constraints and, of course, skyrocketing costs. Well, happy day, voiceover people. MXL informed Harlan that his order had arrived in Long Beach and was going through required quality control testing of each mic today. And by the way, although it's difficult, Harlan is keeping the price the same despite inflation and logistics costs. So if you've wanted one, now's the time to order your Harlan Hogan Signature Series VO1A voiceover mic today. Go to voiceoveressentials.com. Hey, it's time for our Source Connect spot because they are sponsoring, the parent company of Source Connect is sponsoring our show, Source Elements, and we really appreciate it. And why would you want to know about Source Connect and who should know about it? Well, why is the reason why is because the best best paying gigs generally are going to be using technology like source connect. Why? Because this is a tool that allows the production to run like a well-oiled machine as though you're actually physically at their studio, but you don't have to be, you can be at your home studio. And as long as you've got good audio quality, you've got control over the environment. You don't have a lot of noise interruptions from outside and you've got good gear reasonably good. We're not talking about thousands of dollars worth of microphones, but a good sounding signal chain that you can rely on. You can do source connect sessions. Now you want to have a good solid internet connection. Really an ethernet connection is preferable over Wi-Fi for sure. And you might even be requested to have ethernet, but that ensures that there will be no wireless interruptions to the audio and you're going to get the most reliable connection possible. This is going to let you be directed remotely, recorded remotely, and even sit in on the post side of the session where they end up editing the session and getting approval from the client while everyone waits. It's pretty cool. And it really ensures that everybody hears and gets what they want out of that session by the time they say goodbye. Really great technology. If you want to get a promo discount, you can do that or you can just get a demo, head over to source-elements.com. 15-day free trials are available. You don't need to have an iLock dongle to do it. You just have to have the free iLock account. Um, and get yourself set up and running so you're ready to take on the big sessions. Anyway, let's get on to the show. There's questions to be answered right after this. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. The technical perfection continues here on Voice Over Body Shop. <laughs> anyway, we have a ton of questions here. 
This is what makes this show really fun. You guys get to ask questions. So let's start off uh, with Grace Newton. It says, what does one typically mount their road arms to? Their road arms. Mine is currently mounted to the desk where my Mac and interface are. But last Tech Talk, George said that that's not advisable because of bumps and et cetera, stuff like that. Always best to mount it to the wall, isn't it? Yeah, if you can. I mean, if you have a wall close enough to where your mic arm is going to go, mount it to the wall. There is actually wall mount brackets available. Heil, H-E-I-L, um, makes a wall mount bracket. And there's some other company that's not known, well known, but if you look on Amazon or look around online, you'll find wall bracket mounts for your microphone arm where you can actually, they're, they're relatively universal. Like I've seen very few variations on the way these are designed. So if you get the generic one that you'll see on Amazon or the high, the Heil product that was out of stock for a long time, maybe it's back, um, attach it to any wall closest to you. And, uh, and you're going to be much happier because you're going to get rid of that desk collision, uh, hard drive vibration, uh, thumping, uh, problem pretty effectively that way. Yeah. It's, it's always a problem. I mean, I can tap on my desk, you know, and it's not, you're not going to get, that's right. why you mount it to the wall. You do not connect it to your desk. Usually, yeah. usually the best thing is to have a floor mounted stand, or if you've got a retriculated arm like this one best to mount it to the wall. And, uh, so that's the best answer for that. Uh, and that's why we always say that you have the one from Patricia. Hi, Patricia. Uh, what's the best way to, s to, to set the twisted wave for voiceover? Hopefully there's more to this question. Well, yes, there is. <laughs> there is. <laughs> uh, so we can't edit the loud portions after with twisted wave. Sure you mark. can. <laughs> um, Yes, you can. You absolutely can. Um, I use an Apollo solo and sometimes I'm a newbie. Um, I don't know what to do after I normalize to minus three dB, et cetera. But then some loud portions are still loud. Okay. That's question one. So here's the thing. Like if you're doing auditions, some compression is going to be a little bit helpful. So compression is that thing that allows you to control the dynamics a bit. So the loud, 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 isn't so darn loud over the quiet parts. And that I think is more helpful for animation stuff where you have these very wide swings and dynamics. If you're doing commercial auditions or anything narrative, that's just spoken word. Don't worry about it. Like those dynamics, it's part of your performance. It's just the way you're acting. Um, if you want to control it, you can control it through your performance. If you really need to adjust it in post, Dan and I can train you on how to do production. We can teach you how to record, how to edit, how to control levels, how to use a compressor, all that kind of stuff. If that's something you want to get into, but all that absolutely can be done in Twisted Wave, in Adobe Audition. It doesn't matter what audio editor doll you're using. You can do those things. There's just steps in the process to doing it. And uh, we can show you how. Yeah. And they're not, and they're not hard. I mean, they're, it's really important to really understand what all those dynamics are. I mean, we were just talking a little bit about, you know, where, you know, the crossover points and stuff like that, but what is amplitude and how do you, how do you control all that? And, uh, you know, my thing is generally there are physical ways to make sure that you do it right. And the, the more you can do physically to prevent problems, the less problems you'll have on the other end. But if you, you know, normalizing is one of those things that is horrendously misunderstood. You know, most people think if you record too low, well, you just normalize it. But you also increase the background noise considerably. Uh, she also had a question about mouth clicks. What's the holy grail to prevent them? <laughs> I go with this stuff. I actually had to use this today because I had a very spicy lunch. Um, uh, but it's called Alkalaw. You can get it over the counter at your pharmacy, mix a 20 to one with water, spray about 10 sprays into your mouth. Use a, you know, find a, a sprayer and, uh, just, just don't use a, a mouth numbing sprayer because the stuff is still in there. It's brand anyway. 
<laughs> yeah, that's not a joke. <laughs> yeah, you don't but want no, anything it's lidocaine, happened. lanocaine, any cane yeah. stuff. Make stuff sure does not, not a... wash out of the bottles for some reason. But <laughs> this stuff works. It is miraculous for for a l k a l o l for the podcast <laughs> listeners out there. Yeah. L O L for for whatever. <laughs> uh, okay, T J. Let's see here. T J. Metzacapo voiceover. Hey, Dan and George, that's us. I'm using a Rode NT1 and the Audion ID4 with Mogami Gold cables. Great. For some reason, though, the audio is super low and has a lot of interference hits. What can I do to fix it? Thanks. Well, not enough specificity there. Mm. Uh, it could be all sorts of things. If you've got a good mic in NT1, you've got an Audion ID4, which is an excellent interface, Mogami cables, which are... The kind cables. of gold standard. Yeah. Right. Uh, why is it low? You got to turn up your gain. If you've got it cranked all the way, perhaps you've got something choking it off, like a 10 dB pad or something, which is not on the NT1, nor is it on an Audient uh, ID4. So where is your gain set? Uh, and People also, mistakenly set the gain way too low on an low, Audient ID4. Right, right. You've got to really crank it up to about over 80%. Uh, to make the the ID4 work, it's got a, a a a logarithmic scale that gives you much more gain in the upper 10, 15 percent than in the lower parts. But remember, all of this stuff was designed for recording music and lots of dynamic changes and loud audio, where you're going to be turning it down. And you know, if you're playing a trumpet into a microphone. Yeah, you don't have to have high gain, but voiceover, which is much more conversational, you got to really crank it. So that is probably the issue. That's my best guess. I mean, yeah. if it's something beyond that, then there's a technical flaw in one port of your equipment. Um, uh, he said he sent in the audio, so at some point we'll be taking a listen to it, I guess. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there might be another technical flaw. If you don't have an alternative piece of equipment, because when you're doing t troubleshooting, you have to swap things out one at a time, right? Right. So if you don't know why you're getting this result, you have a lot of things to swap. You have computers. <laughs> You've got USB cables. You have the interface itself. You have the mic cable, which I think in this case is the least likely culprit, but who knows? And you have the mic. So being able to swap out each thing one at a time until you narrow down what's causing it is part of that process. So... Keep that in mind. You might want to get another very, very basic interface as a backup or an alternative to your ID4. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you rely on your gear to make a living, you should have a backup for each thing that you use. Um, you know, having multiple microphones and multiple interfaces is not that big of an expense if you didn't overspend in the first place. Good point. So, you know, you should have that uh, available too. He yeah. said the gain's two to three o'clock. That, that is still pretty low. You need it that, to be about four to five o'clock on the ID four to get a healthy recording level. That's been our experience. Yeah. Uh, play the voice, real kids, VO family. Great show. Follow up for a question for tech talk. Is there a microphone you would say is better suited for young kids, voice frequencies than others? I'll say a mic is a mic is a mic. <laughs> and you know, it's not, it's not going to make a difference. If you use proper microphone technique, you're not going to book a gig or not book a gig because of the microphone you're using, as long as you're using a good microphone. Yeah. If you're using a good, what, what do standard, you think? <laughs> well, if you're using a good standard <laughs> condenser microphone, yeah. uh, like this, uh, AT20, uh, oops. AT23, <laughs> not this one you just heard fall on my desk. This thing is like a hammer. You don't want one of these. This is a yeah. dynamic mic. This is don't made for that. being sung into and screamed at. But if you're using a decent quality condenser mic like this one, one or that's the Harlan Hogan VO1A. The VO1A, it's above Dan. Um, I'm using a shotgun mic called the NTG5 from Rode. Um, and this is a this is a $150 one. Um, Great microphone. You're going to be fine because all these mics were designed to record, except for the shotgun mics, were really specifically are more for dialogue. All these condenser mics like this are music oriented and they're designed to record the entire spectrum of audible sound. <laughs> so 
whether your kid's voice is this octave or in this octave, or if they're down in this octave, yep. any good modern microphone will record all of those frequencies almost essentially the same. So it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Any quality condenser mic can record any frequency of a human voice right. equally and, well. And remember, the more, sens the more expensive the mic, the more sensitive it is, the more the acoustics of the room you are in come into play, background noise, that sort of thing. Uh, you don't want a great microphone will not change the way you read copy. I'm getting really upset with people saying, you got to try this mic. It's not going to make a difference, guys. If you, you can't read your way out of a paper bag, it's not going to change it. Uh, you get BC's question. Something about static. Failed. Mike, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that TJ's issue based on more notes that keep, keep coming down the pipeline that he's got a bad NT1. Sounds pretty much like uh, it to me. I've, since he's, I've heard it happen. Since he's already swapped everything else out. Um, let's see. Sometimes there's, uh, BC says, sometimes there's a static electric shock when I touch the mic. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, Dan, you know how that feels, right? You've dealt with that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it, touching the mic, the mic stand, the interface, or my computer. Is that really bad? <laughs> it, it, is, can it can be, be very bad because <laughs> that spark, that static electric spark, can confuse things. Scramble, scramble the signal in your computer. It can reset things because it's like getting a surge of electricity. And it can freak out your equipment. Um, it can make something reboot. It can possibly make you lose data. I'm not sure if I've ever seen that happen for sure, but there's a lot of things that you uh, that are bad about that. So, yeah, to prevent that, um, if you're in any standard home that has plumbing, the best thing to try to do is to touch a sink or anything metal that is plumbing because your plumbing is going to be attached to the physical earth below. It goes into the ground. And that's where you get ground. You need to ground yourself, which will discharge the static before you touch your stuff. Um, if you don't have that capability, you might want to shop for something called a grounding pad or a grounding mat um, that plugs into the ground of your electrical wiring. That's the, the small, the, the, the pin at the bottom of the outlet. You've got the two slots and then the, the center hole in the middle. That's the ground pin, and that'll discharge, discharge the, uh, the electricity into the ground before it goes into your gear or into your lips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I've fun. had that one. We put a new rug here in the studio, and there's been a couple of painful exchanges between me and positive and negative. It's uh, bang, whoa. It shuts off <laughs> yeah. cameras. It, oh, it's just weird stuff. Uh, uh, static electricity is not a lot of current. It, never, it won't kill anybody. Right. But it's a lot of voltage. It's actually quite a lot. And that's enough to disrupt um, electronics. Um, last one, part of the second part anyways, and if the power goes off prior to turning down the gain, sort of like a blackout or an operator error, does that harm the mic? No, generally not. I, if you have a mad, bad electrical surge from a lightning strike, that could that, that, that could, could fry everything. That could fry a lot of things because that's a like high power voltage surge. But no, I think just shutting things down improperly or unplugging them in the wrong order generally will not damage any modern condenser mic. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Yeah, not as much as a lightning strike on a radio antenna. <laughs> I've seen transmitters just. <sighs> oh boy. Yeah, that's yeah right in the middle of ratings too. Not a good thing. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Grant, since you stop, see, now I don't get this. Since you stopped recommending the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 and Solo, do you have a comparable interface to recommend that doesn't cost $6.2 million? I don't recall not recommending the Focusrite 2i2 and Solo. It's well, an option. That, that was a piece of my news two weeks ago. Right. Well, Tim, Tim Friedlander was saying that some, several studios, some in, New studios York, in New York. I, so I, I, I'm not saying that it's a bad piece of gear. I'm just saying that there, is some, there are some studios that for some reason have a prejudice against that product. And I don't know exactly why. I know yeah. Tim said he has had some 
inconsistencies with that piece of gear, some bad experiences with that piece of gear. And the thing is, there's three different generations of Scarlets. There's one, two, and three. And I don't know which of them, maybe one, of, maybe it was the two that had a bad rap because they had the one, they had the two, then they had the three. The three, the three yeah, came yeah. out pretty quickly after the two. Maybe the two has some problems. I don't know. But whatever it is, they, they had some kind of a reason to believe it's not pro quality. At the end of the day, you can buy a, a Steinberg UR12, same basic price, and it's going to give you the same basic features and give you the same basic sound quality. So that one's totally fine. Um, if you need to be totally portable, um, you want something very portable, you could go with the MicPort Pro. Pro, yeah, Not the MicPort Pro $2 too. million, dollars, but $300. Um, and then something else in the middle would be like the SSL2. Um, I've had very good luck with that, with my recommendations and people that have had it. Um, and that's in the $250 range. So Not near 6.2 million. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're all anything over, you know, I mean, the, the Solo is what, 120 bucks? There's, there is like. a new one from Personas. I think it's called the Go. Yeah. I have not personally had or used one yet. It's yeah. $80. Yeah. And Universal it, Audio has the, uh, the, the, the Bolt or the Volt? They have the, that's right. There's a new series from Universal that goes sort of the, to the more basic way of operating, not with the complex, super difficult to use console. Called the Volt yeah. series. Yeah. You could check and, out the Volt One right. is another option. They're yeah. all under two hundred dollars, so yes. nowhere near six point two million. And uh, you know, don't exaggerate that much. Uh, <laughs> okay, we got a question here about a webcam. Let's go on to J. Horace Black's question here about a Google Mini speaker. Is this not an IoT device? Again, describe. What's an IoT device? An IoT device is any device that connects directly to your network over Wi-Fi or Ethernet. So if it's a Bluetooth device that just uses Bluetooth, that's not on the Internet. It's not Internet of Things. If it's a device that you control with a wireless, a wireless remote like this, um, it could be an Internet of Things if you had to set it up using your router or your Wi-Fi. If you had to type your router's Here's the thing, right? How many times have you had to go into some strange application and type in the router's username, not the username, but the router's password, the yeah. password you use to connect to your Wi-Fi network? This is why these Internet of Things can be a security risk because that $10 Chinese Wi-Fi light bulb knows the access credentials for your Wi-Fi network. Now you're getting where I'm at why these things can be a little bit risky. So uh, you want to be careful. That's, that's what we're talking about when we're saying um, an internet of things device. Probably a Google speaker is one of the least likely things you have to worry about because I would think that Google would be extremely careful to make sure its software is up to date and is safe. Um, but yes, that technically is an IOT thing. Yeah. Uh, play the voice, Real Kids VO family. That's such a long title. Maybe just reduce it to like Phil or something like that. Uh, for, for submitting auditions, is it better to normalize the audio before sending or just send the raw audio is captured? Well, it depends. Uh, normalization. Now, there are different views on this and different people have different ways of looking at it. Uh, our friend Uncle Roy always says, when you finish recording, normalize stuff before you start working on it. And then once you finish all the processing, normalize it again to get it to back to to uh, to negative three. Um, it's badly misused. It's misunderstood. If you record right in the first place, your modulation is proper. If you normalize, it shouldn't do anything. Meaning that you very little or very little. And uh, so if you've recorded and you've got nice fat uh, waveforms you know, but you're not over modulating. If you normalize, it's not going to hurt anything. So yeah, you can do it, but I would want to see what your recordings look like first, because if you normalize stuff that's recorded too low, you're going to be adding a lot of hissing and white noise and stuff like that. So don't do that. Uh, but if you're recording properly up front, yes, you can normalize uh, afterwards. Okay, you get a question. 
I'll do it. <laughs> Patricia says, are you familiar with the Cinco Mic D2? As a yeah. matter of fact, we are. Yeah, because uh, they did a hell of a good job of marketing it on YouTube through influencers, getting them in the hands of a lot of influencers. And they've, uh, they've done a really good job of getting their brand out there that way. So, yes, we have. I'm familiar with it. It sounds fine. It's nothing special, but it sounds fine. It doesn't sound anything at all like the mic it's imitating, like the 416. This is a shotgun mic. It doesn't sound anything like the Sennheiser MKH 416. So you get that out of the way. <laughs> um, it sounds fine. Uh, I have not shot it out or compared it directly to any of the shotgun mics I have. I have the Rode NTG4 and the 5, um, so I can't say how it compares to that. But I can say I've heard it many times because people have bought them because they're so cheap. And I've heard them, and they always have a very natural, and I would say they're sort of a flat sound. So I think they might be really good on women. If you have a tendency towards sibilance, it will smooth that out. Or if some men have some tendency towards sibilance as well, it's going to smooth that out. But if you have a darker voice like I do, not a lot of high-end frequency content, it's going to sound rather dull on my voice, and I might have to brighten it up later to get the sound that I would want it to sound like. So, Dan, how about you? Have you heard some samples from the Cinco mm, Mic D2? No, I, I don't believe in in modeling mics. It's not <laughs> I, a modeling it, mic. It's just when, a cheap shotgun mic. It's like yeah. a $200 shotgun. Oh, 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 yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it sounds okay. You know, if you, if you put it, if you use it right, if you use the right pr technique with it, no one's going to know what mic it is in the first place. That's the thing I don't get. You know, it's like, you know, you've got operators, you know, engineers in New York saying you can't use a 2i2, a Scarlett 2i2. Okay, I'm using an Audi and Audi 4, but I'm still using my, <laughs> my focus, right? 2i2. There's two. absolutely <laughs> no way they'll know. Exactly. What Unless you tell them. It. So, one's the word on that. Not one. a clue. Yeah. Henry LaRock has got a good question here. Best mixer for a home studio. Seen a few for podcasts with memory, opinion, old radio guy from the Gates Yard and auto audiogram, and others with the round pie to <laughs> are <laughs> The thing is, what are you mixing? Uh, you know, all of the all of the interfaces today. You know, some of them have like two inputs. If you're only doing one microphone and you're not mixing anything else, why would you even use a mixer? Now, I'm using uh, the Rode uh, Caster Pro, which is indeed a mixer made for podcasting, but it also works great for voiceover. But I do a lot of other things aside from just voiceover. So it's important that you understand that a mixer isn't the answer to all sorts of problems because, you know, people aren't running ISDN anymore. Right, George? And that was why people yeah. would use mixers. It created a hydra of... Of, of cables and stuff like you don't have to do that anymore. All this stuff can be routed in your computer very easily. Uh, and, and very simple interfaces do just fine. And you, you can do the mixing afterwards in post using multi-tracking. So I, I don't get why people are like, I got to get a good mixer. Well, unless you're doing live audio or something and you're trying to mix down a band, but for voiceover, not really that necessary. Yeah, the Roadcaster Pro is the one I have the most experience with and the best overall long-term user experience with. So if you miss that radio console feeling, I would still probably recommend that one if that's what you're after. Yeah. One more question? Yeah, which is an interesting one. Because sort of goes to what we were talking about with normalizing, but uh, noob loudness question. When processing files for auditions... Why are you processing and what processing are you using uh, for auditions or tracks for demos on a personal website? Is there a standard for loudness like normalized to minus three dB with loudness at minus 14 LU? Why do you people go look at all these numbers? It's intimidating. Forget about it. Get your get your modulation right. Get your mic technique right and get your acoustics right. And you don't have to worry about any of this stuff because the engineers don't ask you about it. Do they? Uh, I think the only time I've ever seen specs for this is video game directors saying like peaks around minus 18 and that's about it. Um, 
or audiobook productions where mastering is required at a specific exact dyna- you know, uh, RMS range. Right. Um, I've done some little surveys about it, and the average I seem to be seeing is about minus 20, roughly, for the average level seems to be what most people are delivering their audition files at. It's not a standard, though. So if you're going up as high as minus 14, much, much too loud. I, I would say minus 20 is a, is a range to focus on, but uh, that's been my experience. Yeah. If you're modulating properly, it all comes out anyway, which is, you know, I, I think if you, you concentrate too much on the geeky stuff here and all the numbers and, all, and, and things like that, that's what's intimidating. I, I happen to know Jonathan Grant is a car guy. Oh, no, okay. Sir. Geek. <laughs> he's an awesome dude. He loves hot rods and he's an attention to detail kind of guy. All right, well, you that's... see a picture of his studio. It's amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's easy to get caught in the numbers, but there, there still is no actual established industry standard level for anything that we do overall. Right. Because there's different industries. <laughs> Which is the other thing that I think people forget. You know, you as you said, audiobooks, get video games, commercials, narration, it's all different and all the standards are different because there are no standards. But if you record it right, any engineer is gonna say, Okay, that works. And that's all you gotta worry about. Did you interpret the copy properly? Means a heck of a lot more. Just don't go too low and don't overmodulate, and you'll probably be fine. All righty. Well, well, that was an interesting half hour. I'm going to turn <laughs> off my light now. Bye. Okay. And we'll be right back to finish things up right after this. Before time began, there was VOBS.TV. Watch or else. Hey, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th. And we talk a lot in this business about moving forward with our career, getting more information, We often don't talk about simply getting started. It can be one of the most immovable objects in in our life, getting out of our own way and just simply taking the first step. And if you're watching this podcast, uh, VoiceOver Body Shop, for some tips on how to get started in VoiceOver or to change something about your VoiceOver career or to increase your knowledge in a certain area, Check out VOHeroes.com's Getting Started in VoiceOver. If you go to VOHeroes.com slash start, you'll get all the information. Uh, It's really cheap. And I give you a lot to get started in the business, but you might also learn something if you've been in the voiceover business for a while. VOHeroes.com slash start. That's VOHeroes.com slash start. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, Their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The VoiceOver Body Shop. And we're back to get out of here. But we still got a couple of things we got to cover. Uh, next week on this show, we got another great guest. I'm not saying who. So stay tuned for that. Who are our donors of the week this week? We have Jonathan Grant. Christopher Epperson. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Thomas Pinto. Shelley Avellino. George Whittam, your dad. Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Rader. Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions. Shauna Pennington Baird. Martha Kahn. Don Griffith. 
Trey Mosley, Diana Birdsall, and Sandra Manwiller. All righty. Remember, if you want to, uh, you want to have, you want to get your audio right, and you want to learn from the guys that know what it's, what it's supposed to sound like. Well, you can talk to us. You can go to my website, which is homevoiceoverstudio.com and see all the stuff I do. And George, you go over, you want to talk to George, you go over to George the dot tech. And I just happened to notice somebody asked about how do you donate to the show, Dan? Well, go to our website, vobs.tv, and right underneath the big screen, it says donate now. Yes. Please donate in red. Let's look for that at the bottom right below the video image. And you can make a one time, just a little contribution if you heard something helpful. Or you can make a small subscription donation on a monthly basis through PayPal. Yeah. So click on the red and give us some green. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, thanks to our sponsors tonight, uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And, and JMC, JMC Demo. Demos. Thanks to Jeff Holman for a great work in the chat room tonight. Lots of questions. You know, we, we seem to get more questions for tech talk than we do sometimes for the guests. Oh, which that's is definitely fine. become the case. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. And, uh, we appreciate those questions. Uh, Sue Merlino for putting up with us for the last two hours and, uh, our technical director getting it done. And of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, kids, it's not an easy business. You gotta be, you gotta be a good voice actor. And you got to get your audio sounding right. But we've come to the conclusion that if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. Tech Talk. Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. We'll see you next week. Have a good one, everybody.